This fantastic footage, which shows a volunteer Cossack unit training with the Wehrmacht in 1943, fits in nicely with today's video. I'll read through the first part of a German corporal's diary that was written in February of that year while serving in the Caucasus region. We'll follow his unit's progression on an original 1943 Wehrmacht map. At the end of this first part in the series, I'll show more of the Cossacks' training footage, so stick around. This series takes place around the same time as the last five-part series, which focused on an original German battle report, which describes the destruction of mobile group Popov to the south of Kharkov in the Ukraine. You will see a link to that series at the end of this video. This diary covers events that took place in the Taman Peninsula and the area just to its east. It's titled, Abschied vom Kaukasus, Ende Februar 1943. The end of February 1943. After weeks of heavy fighting, the Soviet push into the Caucasus region, which began after the fall of Stalingrad, gained in strength. Eventually, the German command was forced to order a shortening of the front. In our zone, we were ordered to hold fast until told otherwise. Finally, on the evening of February 27th, the order came in. Early the following morning, most of the vehicles would be departing and the remaining would follow shortly behind. Our b wagen or mobile office, which was loaded with the important documents, regulations, maps, and rangefinders, will be leaving in the first group. In the evening, the larger items, for example the document cases, are packed up. All non-essential items are simply left behind. That's how we unfortunately are to be separated from our three metal beds, our table, and our four stools that have served us so well for so long. Our self-made bunk bed was already lost a few days earlier when we needed firewood and it ended up in the oven. At 300 hours, the day of our departure, the weather is luckily quite good. During the night, the ground had frozen, which provided the vehicles with a hard surface to drive on and allows us to get clear of the muddy town. Just before leaving, I cook some liver and then minced beef, mixed with onion and salt in a pan on the oven. We'll certainly get hungry during the trip and something could happen to the field kitchen. On our way out of Krimskaya, we are greeted by a number of Russian planes. Fortunately, it's still dusk and our column of about 70 vehicles isn't spotted. They continue on towards Novorossiysk. A little later, the sun breaks through and suddenly there, in front of us, rises the spectacular Caucasian mountain range with its mountain peaks covered with snow. It looks as though the sun is doing battle with the last of the clouds. It's a magnificent sight. After a short drive through a valley, we enter the mountainous region, where before, with the warmth from the sun, there was an almost spring-like feeling. Now, as we climb in elevation, the temperature drops and winter seems to have returned. The steepening incline is no problem for our V8 Ford, which has four-wheel drive. Carl is a fine driver. He learned how to master mountain driving in Yugoslavia. Where other vehicles in the calm have problems, Carl manages to continue. We pass by two horse-mounted Cossacks, who are easily identified from a distance by their red capes. They look odd with their black fur caps, their long swords, and bright colors. A larger town is reached and there is plenty of commotion from the presence of a large mixture of soldiers and civilians. We see a company of Cossacks, Cossacks in field gray German uniforms, only by the insignia being worn on their collar and shoulders can they be identified as Cossacks. 
Then it suddenly becomes clear what is going on. They are all carrying shovels and digging trenches for the defense of the area. Included in the crowd are Russian women and girls, also with shovels, there to do their part of the heavy work. Their reaction to our presence varies. Many consider us friends, preferring us to the Soviets. They can usually be identified by their appearance, being clean and well kept, wearing fur jackets and nice clothing. This friendliness has much to do with the behavior of our soldiers. With few exceptions, we generally respect the personal property, the food, the livestock of the people of the Caucasian region. Only the chickens are in real danger. Hardly a German soldier has resisted taking at least one. Even the most useful items, such as buckets, pots and pans, axes, saws, oil lamps, are not taken. But a chicken passing by, that'll go straight into our pot. Then there are those who have a more Bolshevik tendency. They see us as the Nazis who have come and destroyed their country. Of these, of course, there are few who actually let their opinion be known. Just as different as their way of thinking is their appearance. Most of them wear bulky stained jackets, tattered trousers, and dirty old head cloths. But here, now, all are mixed together and working with a shovel. It's an odd scene. Before I show the second clip of the Cossack training footage, I'd like to thank my Patreon supporters. Without them buying these originals to make this content would not be possible. If you are not yet a supporter, please consider becoming one. As a supporter, you receive access to exclusive footage that can't be shown here. Sign up for a free account at military1945.com and take a look at some example footage. And now, let's get back to the Cossacks. За тысячи погибших в снегах арктической каторги, за поруганную честь казачью, пей, пей, пей! Thanks for watching.